From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome to another edition of Chicago Newsroom right here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis. Glad to have you back after our little... Uh, we, had, we took a week off for Thanksgiving. How about that? And a lot happened in the last two weeks. So we're in, um, <clears throat> we're in like kind of streets and sanitation, uh, snow, snow command emergency mode here. We got we to gotta talk fast. We got to work hard. We got to get out there and clear all of these stories because we got so much to talk about today, right? We're very happy to say Hal Dardick's back with us again from Cloud Street, Chicago Tribune. Hal, how you doing? Welcome back. Mike Flannery joining us from Fox Chicago 32. Glad to have you with us today, Mike. Thanks for being with us. And also Joe Macaray is here with us today from, uh, from In These Times. There is lots going on with Springfield. There's lots going on with redistricting the city council. We've got schools being closed. We've got schools being reorganized. A million things going on. But before we begin with all the really heavy duty stuff, uh, this is kind of old news by now because it was exactly a week ago that Maggie Daly died, but I just want to just spend a moment on our show to talk about this because um, let's just start with you, Mike. You, you, you had the opportunity to cover her for many, many years, all the years that she was uh, first lady. And I, I'm kind of struck by the, the notion that we've been seeing a lot in the news in the last few days about she was a very public but very private person. She was very hard to know. We don't know much about her. She kind of, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's true. I think we knew a lot about her. I think so, and I think that it, it was the case that I observed. I, I had the chance to um, mix and mingle with members of the Daly family, both uh, publicly and privately, uh, covering, you know, in, early on in her career, she did do interviews. Later mm -hmm. on, she really controlled access. Right. But uh, there, there were, uh, you know, very early uh, in when, when 1980, when they were first running, uh, 82, uh, in 1980, first running for state's attorney, then 82, 83, first running for mayor, um, and then in 89, when he was first elected. In those campaigns, she did do interviews. There was some access to the home at 33rd and Emerald in, uh, uh, in uh, Bridgeport, and, um, and she did talk about her upbringing. Um, and, and then uh, she was very active in different charities. And so if, if you got onto that circuit, as occasionally I did as an MC at, a, at charity events, uh, you could talk to her. And she was in private just as she was in public. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the people who, uh, you know, some of my friends who have, have seen, uh, you know, who knew the dailies, uh, who, who would go to Grand Beach for vacations uh, or had second homes over there, said, once again, what you saw in public is yeah. the same woman yeah. that you saw in private. Well, what, what, I, <clears throat> what I'm getting at is, um, you know, as, as I've mentioned many times, I worked for the city for a number of years uh, uh, until very recently. And um, one of the things I did when I worked in the uh, television department there was I, I worked quite a bit with her on video projects. I spent many hours just sitting in video editing rooms with her where she would be saying, now slip that five frames. Let's bring the audio up a little earlier. I mean, wow. Just, that level of micromanagement. Wow. And I, I always found... So was there, were there secret eruptions and did she bludgeon you with a cane? No, no, no. No, no. no, no. she was just, she, she was the same way. What, what I found, no nonsense. What I found, though, was somebody who was unbelievably driven and professional. I mean, we, we have this, this notion that, you know, she's just this kind of housewife who raised her children and just on the, on the side had a few things to do. I knew her, of course, in the later years after the kids were gone and she was working full time as this sort of professional driven manager. And I know, <clears throat> I mean, I can name you names of people who were practically just burnt to the nub by having to be woken up every, you know, at two o'clock in the morning because she's just had this eruption of ideas of things we're going to do tomorrow. And I, I remember laughing the first time she showed me she had a she had a black a blackberry. This, look at me you know, when they were about the size of a pancake. <laughs> look at this. I can I can be right because you know, I'm up at night and now I can contact everybody and I can send them emails. So she was, we, you know, and, and there were signs of that early on because at St. Francis, uh, the, where she went to high school uh, in Pittsburgh, um, where she grew up in uh, Western Pennsylvania, she grew up in Mount Lebanon, PA. Her mm -hmm. father, Patrick uh, Corbett, uh, had an auto parts dealership. But she was a schoolgirl athlete mm -hmm. uh, in the 60s yeah. uh, at St. At Francis. And then uh, at Dayton, 
you know, she uh, she did well academically and was also, I mean, she was very pretty, bubbly, vivacious. She was the senior farewell queen. I think she was in the homecoming <laughs> court, you know, which, again, yeah, yeah. In, in, in the 60s was, was uh, you know, a, a, a way, you know, that, that was sort of a signal that this was a woman going places. Right, right, right. Um, and, you know, so, so you saw that early on. And then all of the activities, she would get involved. Father Mike Flager tells about the after-school matters money that St. Sabina's got. And how she would just show up unannounced. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, on, you know, at, in, in the middle of the day. Right. And, you know, he said she was kind of checking up on us to make sure we weren't wasting the money. Yeah. Um, and he liked that right, because, right. as he says, we weren't wasting the money. She insisted that, the, despite all of his controversies, she insisted that he be a concelebrant of her funeral mass. So you actually had Father Mike Flager giving communion <laughs> to, that, that to was, Card, Francis Cardinal George. That was quite a moment. That was a moment <laughs> indeed, wasn't yeah. it? All right, folks, we've got to move on here. Um, this is one of these wonderful programs where I've got three people sitting at the table who are all smarter than I am, so I'm going to just <laughs> shut up and let them talk because I just want to hear what's going on here. Um, Joe, we've got, we've got lots happening in the Occupy movement. You've been writing extensively about it. You've got something up on uh, the In These Times uh, site today, uh, Occupy Chicago, but of course the uh, Occupy LA, Philadelphia, lots of, lots of things where they're being moved out. Um, start the conversation for us. What, what, what happens now to Occupy Chicago? Let's keep it local. I, I think the interesting thing with Occupy Chicago is that what's happening nationwide right now, especially since the, uh, Zuccotti Park or Liberty Park was cleared out in New York, is that people are saying, what happens over the winter, which they were already kind of expressing concern about anyway, but specifically what happens over the winter and what happens as more and more uh, police forces in different cities crack down on the movement, shut down the camps. And Chicago, because they've never had uh, a, a, a home base like that. They've never had a camp, and their uh, you know two attempts to sort of set one up resulted in um, arrests and you know fair. I mean fairly uh, low pro profile stuff compared to some mm -hmm. of the dramatic scenes happening elsewhere. But in fact, they have now got this plan to uh, spend the winter doing more in the way of daily actions, kind of zeroed in on specific issues, which which they've done quite a lot of already. Uh, and then plan to reconvene in, uh, in April um, for, a, for a kind of large rally, which will, I think, see them attempting mm. to, uh, to set up a new camp. You guys can j jump in on this, but the, one of the questions that's on my mind is, is, did Rahm Emanuel do them a huge favor by not letting them occupy the horse and keep the horse? That's, that's an interesting question. I think that in terms of, of how that antagonistic relationship has played out. Uh, it's interesting how it's, how it's been different to cities. I think in a way, um, they have been given the, an advantage which looked like a disadvantage for the first couple of months of the Occupy movement. Because when, uh, you know, when Zagotti Park was in full effect, it was this sort of, I mean, depending on whose reports you go by, but it, you know, it, it seemed to some a sort of utopian exercise in community building, and Chicago didn't really have any of that infrastructure, in it, and it looked like a big problem. Suddenly, when Zuccotti Park gets cleared out, people start saying, well, you know, what do you do when you don't have a camp? Right. What, what should the movement look like? And people start looking at cities where they've been having to deal with that for a while. So, I mean, I think you could argue that suddenly it not being about camping out in the same way starts to, starts to look like an advantage, and it made them think about other issues they could be involved in earlier on. Well, how much, you know, I, I have a question for you, and what, the couple of things I've covered that have involved the uh, Occupy Chicago movement, the, the people that have been front and center that when they were uh, protesting the closing of the half of the city's mental health clinics uh, outside the mayor's office, uh, when they were protesting the initial round of arrests, which I think is still the largest number of arrests in, in any city in the United States. The, the people that were out front and center were union members, union organizers. How much of this do you think, and, and I, I don't know the answer, but is a spontaneous movement among the 99% as they call themselves, and how much of it is the union folks coming in and saying, well, here's something that we can find a platform and push our, our issues with? I think there's there's two things going on there. One is the the nature of the Occupy movements in general is that they're fairly porously defined. So 
in order to, to kind of identify uh, as, as a sort of participant in Occupy, you, there's no sort of minimum limit for how often you have to show up to, to an event or a general assembly. Um, and that in itself raises some interesting questions for, for media participation, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, in terms of, I think there is a degree of opportunism, not necessarily in a cynical way, where a lot of people in, in labor movements have said, well, here is a thing with a lot of energy and a lot of media attention that we can, you know, we can use to our advantage. However, in order for, for Occupy Chicago or any other Occupy movement to officially participate in it, they do have to, to pass it at one of their general assemblies. Well, here's my so, observation, and, and, and I, I think it's an important distinction. It's not a cynical thing, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's opportunistic in, in a, a, as a simple definition of the fact that it's out there. Um, when they did the mic check on Alderman Joe Moore, who uh, was among the 50 aldermen who voted for the mayor's right. budget, um, that, that would I, be all the aldermen. Just <laughs> all the aldermen. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, in that crowd, I know, were a number of AFSCME members, uh, including some library employees who were getting laid off. And um, I, I have observed, as, as you made the point, outside the mayor's office, there were some mental, uh, some people from the mental health clinics where those uh, payrolls are being privatized. And, um, and then in the rally, of course, uh, that was held there on Monroe, right next to the Art Institute, um, that there were, there were several thousand SEIU AFSCME members and, and other public employee. Uh, yes, yeah. and that's part of what I kind of observed too. And I and I don't know but the issues that they've had. In addition to the people that have been out front and center for them, have been uh, very closely allied with union issues. Yes, yeah. and, and and I've got to say, I think from uh, from the point of view here, the the, the I, I was in Springfield uh, uh, the other day and the. Uh, uh, Occupy Springfield, which is a fairly small group, um, brought Santa Claus to the rotunda of the state capitol, uh, there to pass out tax breaks to mm -hmm. rich little girls and boys. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was, I thought that was very effective. Good that theater. was a, a little that's bit good. of guerrilla theater. Right, yeah. Right. And uh, that's, I, I, I am firmly in, in uh, the camp that you suggested a few moments ago, Ken. I think that uh, the, the city of Chicago has done these folks a great favor. Uh, I, I think this whole focus on the camp out stuff is idiotic. Um, I, I think the way you change public policy is not by camping out, mm -hmm. it's by, by getting engaged in public debates right. over things like the tax break for Sears, the tax break for CME. The public employee groups, are, of course, are fighting both of those. Mm -hmm. um, the teachers union, uh, very busy uh, trying to block uh, the property tax breaks for Sears. Um, and and the, you know the SEIU, Keith Kelleher and others, uh, Henry Bear, as opposed to giving a tax an income tax break to, to CME, they want to impose a uh, 1.5 billion dollar transaction tax on CME. Mm -hmm. um, so you know by by sitting and camping out at the horse, I I, I, I think CME and Sears would prefer that they were they doing. They would much that. rather have them mm -hmm. there, right. right? Right. So so what you're seeing then is is. And, and we've been observing this for a while on the show here. The, I, I remember saying weeks ago that if, if Occupy America just suddenly went poof overnight, it had already accomplished more than almost any kind of movement of its kind because of its ability, innate ability, whether, whether planned or not, to sort of seize the, the spine of the media and get these messages right. like the 1%. That that one percent came into the American lexicon because of Occupy, and it has I, bolstered President Obama's hand <clears throat> in this in this uh, tax cut fight that's currently underway in Washington. Yeah, I, I would say two things. One is uh, in terms of the labor movement, and obviously in these times has, has been covering the labor movement and focusing on it for a long time. There's a lot of people who have now been saying, how did this happen that we were trying for years <laughs> to get people to listen <laughs> right, to us? Right. Right. And, and uh, we've, we've published both in the magazine and on the website um, various people uh, who cover the labor movement, um, like Mike Alk, Steve Early, who have who have been fairly critical of the labor movement's history of trying to communicate, mm -hmm. which has often involved things like um, saying middle class all the time. Right, uh, right, right, and, right, uh, right. Which doesn't really sound, you know, combative. And the idea was, well, we'll build alliances, et cetera, right. et cetera. Suddenly the Occupy movement comes along. It's in some ways a much more um, combative and sort of robust stance saying, actually, it's the 99% versus the 1%. But then 
In terms of what different parts of the labor movement want to do with that energy, I think Occupy Chicago shows that if they want to oppose specific public policy, uh, you know, things that are being done, then the Occupy movement will get behind them. When it comes to the to unions, and this is going to be a big thing with uh, with next year. When it comes to the unions like SEIU, who have already preemptively endorsed Obama, mm -hmm. um, saying, you know, don't bother doing anything for us for the next year. We're just going to endorse you now. Uh, I think that the idea that you know the Occupy movement will get behind that is yeah. is going to turn out to be a that's going to be an interesting yeah. conflict. Well, I mean, Mike, you opened up something uh, that that I find just incredibly interesting. That was. Uh, part of the veto session you were just covering, or the, whatever you call that. What was that? That one it was, day it was, thing. Uh, it was technically a special session. A special the session. Veto session had yeah. expired. I guess that thing that you drove down to cover and uh, <laughs> for a day. I, I was kind of stunned, and I, I, I maybe I just wasn't following it carefully, but I was just sort of gobsmacked by the way all of a sudden the CME and Sears thing just just like deflated like a like a balloon. It just it just disappeared, and there, there are some people who say that. If it's not directly attributable to Occupy, it's it's the kinds of things that Occupy is bringing up that that the public is saying, wait a minute, well, I'd why be careful do we want to get this money? I'd be careful about okay. that because it passed with a supermajority, 36 votes in the state senate. Mm -hmm. It has more to do with the internal dynamics of the Illinois House okay. and the fact that the uh, that the Amanos Gris, the the man who has ruled the House with an iron fist, uh, <clears throat> who has been in Springfield for 43 years, Mike Madigan, the speaker. Um, uh, because he represented CME, his law firm represented CME, has declared a conflict of interest, and so they're really, uh, uh, they're, they're a bit rudderless on this. Oh, ah, so okay, it's been, interesting, interesting So, so Madigan wasn't on the floor for the debate. Madigan has uh, recused himself uh, even mm -hmm. behind the scenes, although he has met with Terry Duffy from CME. Um, he has been, as I understand it, participating in some of the scheduling uh, uh, votes mm -hmm. uh, discussions on the substance he stayed away so the, so it's it, it's been up to this downstate uh, Democrat John Bradley who's chair of the House Revenue Committee he's been uh, he's been running it uh, and uh, and also Tom Cross on the Republican side the Republican leader from mm -hmm. Oswego but I mean you gotta you got to imagine that that representatives uh, looking at this are saying we're in this crisis mode we're cutting 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 we have no money we we are opposed to tax increases and now you're saying you want to give even more money to Sears to stay in Hoffman Estates? Well, What's that it, about? Let well, them go. If, 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 if Ohio wants to give them $400 million, <laughs> let them go. No. And, um, and, and again, the teachers unions have uh, the IEA uh, out there in School District 300, uh, where, you know, the, which includes the Hoffman Estates uh, territory where Sears has its headquarters, but also includes Algonquin, Carpentersville. There's, there's a series of communities in that northwest corridor, northwest suburban corridor. Um, school District 300, uh, uh, one of the bigger school districts in the state, um, has brought the IEA uh, uh, Teachers Union and then the IFT Teachers Union uh, in, into the fight against the property tax piece of this. Mm -hmm. Sears, remember, hasn't paid any Illinois income tax. There's that. There's a huge difference between CME, which pays six to seven percent of all the corporate income tax in the state of Illinois, 158 million dollars uh, uh, in, in this current year, La last year I think, and, and, and then more this year, um, ver uh, or Sears. Sears actually wants the right to take and keep uh, a, a big chunk of the income tax, the state income tax, that it's going to withhold from its 4,000 employees. They want to keep the tax that they withhold hmm. un, un, under this, uh, and, and they also want uh, 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 tax breaks. Now, there's a very real possibility, I think, that Sears is going to go. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and the, the reaction to that, I think, is going to be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the teachers' unions and, uh, and, and those who oppose it are saying, ah, let's call their bluff. Eddie Lampert, the guy who runs uh, Sears and Kmart, uh, and and who many people think is just waiting for the real estate market to revive, and then it's going to and then it's going to it's going to turn out that that these companies are a real estate play because that's what because that's Sears what they are. has just Sears giant, has very centrally located right. stores, beautiful and, pieces of real estate with dead stores on them. Right. You, you know what? We just got the ten minute warning already. Hal, get in here. What are we? What's going on with the city council? There, to, was today some kind of an actual deadline for under, the city under council state statute to, to reapportion itself? Under state statute, the city has to, on December first, in the year after the, the centennial census, has to pass a remap. 
course, they didn't do that 10 years ago. They did it on December 19th of 2001. Nobody sued. There were no repercussions. But they really are uh, sort of in uh, 11th hour mode here. They have to get something done because if they don't get something done before long, people could sue. They have to, they have to redraw the, the 50 words. And the aldermen the last two nights have been at City Hall in heated meetings uh, discussing this issue. Uh, and it's, it's really, to, in order to get it passed without uh, going to a referendum next year, they have to have 41 of the 50 votes. And you don't think council. they have those? A, as it stands today, they're, they're not close, primarily because the Black Caucus is not on board. The map that is floating around out there right now uh, increases uh, from uh, about 10 uh, Latino wards uh, today to 13. Latino wards, and the numbers pretty strongly back up the Latinos in this. Even though they only gained 25,000 people in the last 10 years, they were probably underrepresented 10 years ago, and the uh, African Americans lost 181,000. Right, and they people. had 19 uh, essentially black right, dominant right, wards, right. right? But in order to do that, you're going to put uh, on the south side, you're going to put uh, Tony Folks and Alderman Thompson in the same ward. They'll have to duke it out, so they're going to lose one ward there, and uh, this is kind of uh, w would be funny if it weren't so serious for Alderman Willie Cochran, but, but his ward goes up to the north side uh, to uh, above Scott Wagsbeck's ward, and that's the new 20th would ward. Be the tw so the 20th so ward would just literally it goes, move. Poof. It just and disappears yeah, where That's it is. the way 34 <laughs> moved from the north side to the south side back in 1970. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But they lost, there, there's 53,000 additional uh, p white folks on the north side. And the South Side lost 181,000 uh, black folks. Nick Spazzato, the freshman uh, from the 36th Ward, which has been always been a white uh, ethnic ward, and, but you know he's sort of the weak, weaker political mm -hmm. guy there, and he had the nerve to defeat the uh, the banks. Uh, the right, right, was left of right. It, if anything, and his ward would become uh, Latino. If he weren't still also. alive, Banks would be turning over in his grave, right? <laughs> 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 to see what's happened to his ward. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other thing is that, in, and I think the back of the yards folks make a good case, you know, historic community, uh, nearly entirely Latino. They want, they want a ward instead of being divided among five mm -hmm. uh, African-American wards. Mm -hmm. But, but the African-Americans are not, not on board. So They're it looks like a referendum? It's, I, I'm not going to predict at this point. How does point that work? How, how, which, which, which it, to choice, actually, which ten aldermen have to agree and pass, uh, approve a map, and say, "Well, we're going to put this on the ballot." So, if you got ten or more from the the Black Caucus, and they said, "We're going to put this map," that they get to do it. It goes to the March primary, and the voters choose. It happened 20 years ago. That happened in. in the, but in but then you know certain people, Daly got behind the map that that he liked, and that. Uh, pretty handily. Comes the fight over the fair map and exactly right. Exactly. So, so it would appear on the March primary ballot as like, is it A or B? You you vote for map A or vote exactly. Exactly. And, and could there be a map C? There could if you got. So you could have a Latino map, an African American map, <laughs> oh, and then a white no. ethnic map. Yeah, but oh, I don't, I don't no. think that's going to happen. I think that that you, if anything, you'll you'll see two. And the other thing that that could happen, and I think this is the strategy that's going on. Uh, among Alderman Mao, who's leading this effort as chairman of the Rules Committee, and uh, his, I would call them Latino partners at, at this point, because they're sort of on the same page, is you get those two groups together, okay, Spazzato's not going to vote for it, but most of the other white aldermen are, all the Latino aldermen are, and you tell, uh, if, if you can get 10 of the 19 black aldermen on your side and say, look, you're going to be safe, you're going to get reelected, you know, why don't you go along with this, and they agree, then they can get it uh, on the, uh, they can get the 41 votes. Where are we in the discussion about whether we should cut the city council to 25 wards? <laughs> I guess Nowhere. That, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 I guess that disappeared after the, the day after the election. That <laughs> was, I, I thought, overplayed in, in some yeah, ways. It was right. suggestion made uh, to one uh, by alderman the BGA, right. uh, by, by the mayor. Yeah, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it really wasn't mentioned to right, very right. many no, aldermen. It, 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 it was sort of, uh, you know, well, I, I could 
try to do this yeah, too yeah, and see yeah. where that takes. Well, you. I, I bring. I'm just being. <laughs> I'm being completely sarcastic because it's just. It's hilarious that that you know there was this moment of discussion about whether the city council should be made smaller. Now we're debating how we're going to keep it at 50 by. We got to. We got to choose yeah. somebody to. Yeah, in the recent budget, <laughs> you'll notice that the uh, the aldermanic uh, budget uh, is intact, mm -hmm. even though everything else was cut. Right. So uh, these are partners that the uh, yeah they voted 50 to zero for his budget, but they uh, got something in return, and I I think uh, you're not going to see <laughs> warfare between the mayor's <laughs> office and, and the city council. In the couple of minutes we got left, we got a, we got so many items left on the table here. Anybody want to take on the school closings and restructuring issue? I mean, this is this is a really big deal, isn't it? That yeah. we're. I, I think the interesting thing is the the other thing that came out this week that you know it turns out charter schools don't actually do that yes, much better. Yes. Right, right. Um. And uh, the response has been, well, we never said they were a magic bullet, mm -hmm. but you know, but they're still the best option. Um. Right, right. And it's absolutely nothing to do with how well connected these people are. It's interesting that that data was out there all the time, but it but it's finally been sort of put into one package where it's much more easy to to read and that and that make then you then you're able to sort of stack them all up together using the same grid right. on the chart and it looks a whole lot different. I yeah. mean the, the the data that points to the flaws in the kind of education reform movement mm -hmm. uh, has been out there for a while and um, you know this is something that's obviously playing out at a national level as well uh, and has a lot to do with you know Duncan and his rise but um, but yeah. Part of it too I think has been the utter incompetence in, in terms of presenting their case of the teachers union. Mm -hmm. It's I've, I, I, I have rarely seen such a grotesque spectacle. Absolutely, and it, this, uh, this again is another example of, uh, and Ben uh, Jarevsky of The Reader wrote about this, um, mm -hmm. that, that they really did not get their act together in terms of even realizing there was a PR battle going on uh, until too late. Um, but in, in, again, it's something where uh, something like the Occupy movement does seem to have uh, provided a, a kind of a way to channel that, you know, because they're willing to take on um, mm -hmm. these kind of fights as, as part of this kind of larger movement. Guys, I, I can't believe it. We've just burned up the show again. <laughs> We're out of time. And we haven't even, you know, well, it gets so frustrating because the list is so long and the time is so short. I want to thank you all for being here today. It's been really wonderful. I hope you'll all come back again. Hal Dardick, of course, from the uh, Cloud Street uh, of the Chicago Tribune, the venerable Chicago Tribune. Thanks for being with us again. Mike yeah. Flannery, Fox 32, uh, Fox Chicago News. Great to have you around, thank you. Mike. I it's hope fun. you'll come back again. Good sometime. to see you again. And Joe Macaray joining us for the first time from In These Times. Uh, you can see his stuff online and, uh, and pick it up in these times. It's available everywhere. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you again next week right here on Can TV Channel 19. You can see this and all the other programs uh, available right here on cable, but you can also see them on uh, cantv.blip.tv. Check us out there. Subscribe on iTunes. Uh, get the audio podcasts, all those ways of checking in on uh, Chicago Newsroom, and I'm glad you did today. Thanks. I'm Ken Davis. We'll see you next time.